For those who don't know me, my name's Rick Dawson. I'm a HDR candidate at IMH under the wonderful supervision of Cathy Sherrington and Marina Pinheiro. And my topic's on telehealth for older people and one of my outcomes is on falls. So today I will be chairing the um, our CRE session. And we've got two speakers today and we've split the talk into two 30-minute slots, mainly from a scheduling issue. But Simon will be presenting first. So, and then... He'll be um, talking to us about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have some questions for Simon from the group. And then at 2 o'clock, Professor Andrew Wilson will be um, coming into the Zoom and uh, concluding our hour of education. Um, so probably we'll have some specific questions for Simon and then some specific questions for Andrew. But Simon does have the capacity to stay for the whole hour. So if we feel like there's a question for both that we want contribution, maybe just set up in the chat for me. I'm quite happy once we open up to the group, just raise your hand either figuratively or literally over with your real hand or your remote hand and I'll just direct some questions. Um, so in my other role, I, the Vice President of the Australian Physio Association, and um, Simon um, came to the APA at the end of the last year as our General Manager for Policy and Government Relations. And he has a wealth of experience around advocacy, um, and the title of his session is called Getting Your Voice Heard. But specifically, he has come from uh, working from the AMA, Mental Health Australia, in policy and advocacy. Um, he's been the manager of media and marketing at ACT Health, um, but he's also worked in federal parliament as a media advisor for over 10 years. So um, he's been really pivotal, pivot, uh, really influential in um, sharpening uh, the APA's advocacy message. And I thought it would be really nice for a session just to hear from him to give all of us who are researchers. Um, have we got the right ammunition in our tool belt to sort of influence funders and the community to bring our research into practice? So over to you, Simon. Oh, thank you, Rick. Thank you also, Sandra, and everyone for inviting me. I'm really um, honoured to, to be asked to speak to you about the most difficult topic of all, which I wrote down as tips for researchers on how to get politicians to hear about your research. And... I don't really have many answers, but I thought I'd just run through some things, talk to you a little bit, happy to take questions. Um, and also not everything I say might be what you want to hear, but I figure it's better just to talk to you, have some discussion and questions and to do this. And so I've been involved in the health field on and off for 20, 25 years in parliament and for NGOs. And this is the hardest question of all. So I'll tell you a few things that I know or have learned and then, I'll talk about other things. So the media and parliament and decision makers are really where we're targeting. So APA, AMA, Mental Health Australia, um, worked for the Department of Health. That's our target audience. So how do we get people to hear and act on what we do in research? Now, there's a couple of little rules or rules. Yeah, there are a couple of rules about how the world works. So I'll share some of those with you. Some of them are pretty obvious. But the first thing is you have to offer something that is unique, novel, or never seen before. There are key buzzwords in media landscape, but also in um, the way we respond. And being Australians, like every country, we want to hear things that it's an Australian first, it's a world first, or something's being done in Australia that hasn't been done anywhere else, or um, conversely, something's not being done in Australia can be researched. So... I often look to Commonwealth countries because they're comparable to Australia rather than look at um, countries with different health systems. And there's nothing better than when I was trying to get decision makers and go and say, in New, in New Zealand, uh, and they do this. Very hard for more support for the universities. And the fact that there was a billion dollars for research in the budget last year was in large part. Andrew, can you mute everybody for a minute? Now, you know, there's an. Great, sorry. So I was just going to say one of the things that's really useful is to say in New Zealand they do this or in Canada in the UK, but we're not doing it here and our research highlights this. So the unique novel never seen before can also be turned around, which is what an embarrassment. This is being done elsewhere, but our country is not doing it, even though the research shows this. Second point I'd make is 
when you're packaging and marketing your research to always use words where you can, obviously don't use a word, it's not a uh, landmark, groundbreaking, world first. Um, so the um, APA just produced the economic value of physiotherapy report, hadn't been done before. So I called it a landmark report, groundbreaking. It had never been done before, which is true because it had never been the 11 physio interventions that were modelled um, had not been done in that way before. So you need to actually say, obviously, why it's landmark, groundbreaking, a first in Australia, a world first in research never conducted before. Is it the most people surveyed, the widest group, the first looking at this kind? So word use is very important. And that word use needs to be very much upfront when you're marketing and promoting your research. Now, when I used to teach, I used to teach media studies as well, media um, training privately for a while. And we used um, an American um, data that the question was put, what is to the media? What is the number one thing that drives the media worldwide? The big pyramid of what leads in the media? And the simple answer is conflict. Now, conflict doesn't have to be wars. It doesn't have to be the Middle East. It doesn't have to be anything. But conflict is also, he said, she said, or where you put two perhaps different groups together. So the conflict might be our research shows somebody else's research isn't right or our research counters previously known research. I mean, you get it all the time. Your new research shows four cups of coffee gives you cancer. New research shows two cups of coffee. You know, you know what it's like. New research shows drinking red wine. Not yeah. That's if you see, look at the media when they talk about research. It's always the one that gets a lot of attention is when the NHMRC does drinking standards because it's conflict. So they come out and say, this is the drinking standard, two standard drinks per day. And then the alcohol industry go, oh, that's ridiculous. You, you should drink 25 drinks per day, particularly from a Dan Murphy's bottle shop, and we'll tell you why. And so you get a media story that's a conflict. Um, that conflict can be um, looking at our previous assumptions and questioning them. So we've always known this is the case. Now research, and again, if you look at it, it's always what causes cancer it's alcohol related, it's about something else. New research has questioned our previous understanding. Um, it can be, we've said something that no one else has said before, and then you get somebody along, so oh, nobody's ever said that before. That can also be conflict. And the other way that's really important is what we're saying is better, safer, cheaper, more effective. So it's a conflict in the sense that what you're saying is what our research has come up with shows a better way or another way. And then the media can go and interview someone that um, hasn't been done before. So conflict, don't think of it in a negative or prescriptive sense. Conflict is about looking at your research and going, what makes it different? Who might have a different view or who might support it? And does it actually change the assumptions of what we've, we've known before and in what way? Another really important way to get your media known is to have someone, a name attached to endorse it. Now, the name can be a Sandstone University. So if you have a look around the world, Australia, you don't get a lot of research from New England University. Since I grew up in Arvindale, so I love New England University, but you don't get a lot of that. You get Sydney University or ANU. So there is a bias in the media inherently towards Sandstone Universities or top research facilities. Use that. You use words doctor, professor, expert. That's another media thing. You know, um, Simon Tat said today carries no weight, but Rick Dawson, vice president of the APA, said this. It carries the imprimatur and the status of um, you're an expert. And if we know one thing about our very shallow media, I hope there's no journalist here, but our very shallow media in Australia, they love a title or an expert. I, I did see the new ads for... Um, uh, vaccine with Nick Coatsworth and he's got a stethoscope around him, you know, because you're not a doctor unless you've got a stethoscope. That's how simplistic. When we used to do media for, for the AC department, when they interviewed any of our medical people, they made them wear a stethoscope or a white coat and they'd go, I haven't used a stethoscope since, you know, university training. And they went, but you've got to look the part. So you have to play the media game. Three other really important things. The media want human interest. And in fact, the public want human interest. They want someone to talk to and film. Um, your research must be visible. And this is the real thing that I'm sorry to say this to you, but if your research is brilliant and groundbreaking and landmark, but it doesn't have a visual element to it, 
you have less likelihood of getting the kind of attention you want to your research than you do if it's got something visible to it. So we used to call it in the ACT, we had a minister that called it, he wanted something that went ping. That was his term, the Minister for Health. Can you fill me with something that goes ping? And what he meant was, can you put me in the hospital setting at the Canberra Hospital or put me somewhere that looks clinical because shallow world that we live in, um, that gives that setting. And if you see, like, you know, I don't mean to be critical of our prime minister or previous prime ministers, but they love going into a laboratory and donning a wine looking like, oh, I've looked at a vaccine, therefore the vaccine is, is good. We do have a prime minister that loves the stunt, so, you know, um, utopia, yes. Yeah, so you, um, you definitely want to try to think about your research in a visible medium. How would you see that represented visually? Some kind of activity to go with your research. And the last thing is, I'm not talking about the research you do, I'm being really shallow here, I'm talking about the media side, is you need to package it up in clear and precise language. Now, I thought for the benefit of, of sort of being helpful to this and, and um, time, I'd give you an example of something successfully did with the media in research to give you an example. So in 2013, I was um, Director of Communications for what was then the Mental Health Council of Australia, now Mental Health Australia, and we had a great success with research, and I'll tell you how we did it. So we used to do a lot of reports. Mental Health Australia used to do reports every, you know, three or four months. But we did a report called Where's, Where There's Smoke, Cannabis and Mental Health. Now, the reports were only about 30 or 40 pages, glossy, you know, A4 sort of, um, you know, um, annual report style kind of photos and things. The research was not new. The research was not novel. We didn't undertake new research or data. We looked at existing evidence and the research and we packaged it up and we pitched it as a balanced and informed view about cannabis and mental health and summarized this. Importantly, um, and I'll get to this in a second, we called on governments, the mental health sector to pursue certain activities. Now I'll get to this in a, a moment, but having an ask in your research makes the world of difference. Having a recommendation and ask an outcome that you want delivered makes a huge difference to how you promote your research. So this is what we did. We put together a reference group, but on our reference group, we had the Honourable Rob Knowles, who was also our chair, but he was the former Liberal Victorian Health Minister. But we also had on that research group, uh, Donna Ball, who was then CEO of Alcohol and Drug Council of Australia. We had um, consumers, we had drug advocates. So we were putting together, when I talk about conflict, a former conservative health minister with drug advocates into the same reference group. So when we packaged and sold this, we had this diverse, unusual bedfellows. That makes great interest to the media is that, oh, okay, why are these people coming together? We highlighted statistics where I pulled out one key statistic, which was since the last research was done, the average age of a first time dope smoke in Australia dropped to 14.9. I grew up in country town in the 70s, 14.9, I, you know, is ridiculous for someone of my generation. So that really attracted the media is like, oh my God, 14.9 year old kids are starting to use. So we got a media buy in there. We focused on the link and this is where I'm gonna to say to you all, it's not great, but we focused on the link between schizophrenia and psychosis and cannabis. It's a small link, but that's what got our research noticed. But most importantly, we got the former police commissioner, Mick Palmer, to launch the report, and we launched it at Parliament House. And Mick Palmer at the launch said, um, and I quote the code here, we are not going to deal with this issue simply through law and order responses. So we had a classic conflict, former police commissioner launching a report on cannabis saying, we can't solve this through law and order. And we got great media coverage from this. The Greens attacked the paper. Um, uh, the the um, opposition then conservative parties attacked the paper. So we got the conflict we wanted to, to do this because we engendered debate. And as we've actually seen since there, the cannabis debate has moved so far that we now have medical cannibal, cannabis and change drug laws. So we got where we wanted it 10 or 15 years, but we got the change. So here's my advice. I, I was looking at falls and research and I was thinking, here's a couple of things I could share by way of advice for you. Firstly, 
be adventurous in the way you label and describe your, your research. Dry clinical terms. So I'll give you an example. I was um, asked to help out um, then Department of um, Immigration, it's now Border Force, why their media had problems. And they talked about, this is going back a decade or so, they talked about um, the, you know, before Border Force, the department has um, intercepted a vessel. And I was like, what's a vessel? Yeah, yeah. Vessel has three or four different meanings. And they said, it's a fishing boat. And they went, no, 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 that's the technical maritime term. And I went, it means nothing to the public. A vessel, your imagination can be anything, but if you say fishing boat, you know what it is. Likewise, doing annual reports um, uh, for the Department of Health, we had to talk about there were this many live births in the ACT. I said, why can't we just say this many babies born? And they went, no, no, the technical term is live births. It means nothing to the public, really, because the language doesn't um, equate to the, the imagery that you want. It can be difficult in research, but I'm saying not, not in your research papers. I'm not saying change that, but when you package it up or when you go to promote or put a media, use descriptive terms that are understood easily, not dumbed down, but understood by the public. Second thing is, sorry about this, I'm just going to say it, Use emotive terms. You're talking about enforced frail elderly people. You're talking about death. You're talking about prevention of people dying. It's not exploitative, um, and it might sound base, but I don't mean it to be. But you need to use emotive terms. Emotive terms does get attention um, to what you're dealing with. Third question, sell your research. I talked about Sandstone University. I talked about being a first. Um, in selling your research, demand something gets done. Unless the government does X or Y, or unless the Department of Health, or unless aged care providers some does X or Y, we will see more older Australians injured or dying from preventable falls. I don't feel particularly clean saying this. I feel a little bit dirty telling you that's how it works, but it is actually a reality that, you know, emotional heartstrings and a visual does get research paid attention to. I wish it wasn't like that. I wish I was telling you that we actually had a really good media that focused on research because it was bloody good and it's the right thing to do and your fantastic researchers who have dedicated to producing absolutely fantastic um, uh, research documents that guide health policy. But as you probably know, they sit on a shelf and, and often get ignored. So ask you have to position it is what happens if my research isn't picked up? What happens if it's not done? If you're going to launch your research, something I can help you with, you need to follow certain rules about launching things. One is you always do it in an attractive time and place. 11 a.m. on a non-sitting day is the perfect media launch time because news wrap things up by about two o'clock and they need a visual. So if it was me, if you're asking me and you had a piece of research on falls, I'd say we're going to launch it at a residential aged care facility at 11 a.m. Have someone to launch it. We use Mick Palmer. I was just thinking of notes when I was talking to Rick earlier today. I can think of Julie Bishop, Chris Evans, Jan McClucas. I was going to say Bronwyn Bishop, but I'm not, I can't bring myself to say that. But I was thinking there's a whole bunch of former health um, aged care ministers. Find someone like that who's got a name to launch your report. It could be an older actor or actress. Somebody in the public to be with you to launch it as well is really important in, in getting a bit of attention to doctors. I would always go for an ex-politician who carries a name, who worked in aged care um, particularly, but also who could have worked in health. can be a state person, but it's good to have someone who's a familiar face and speaker to say launch this report. You can hire lobbying firms and events people to do that if that's what you want to do. Um, another good thing when you do a launch is try and attract people from different aspects of the health system. So it's physio, but it might be care, a family might be an ED, it might be somebody else. The range of people to say this report, you know, is absolutely vital, this research, this whatever can be very good. When launching it to get the attention of media, of, the, of, of members of parliament, give them something to do. So are you advocating for a pilot program? Are you advocating for change in legislation? Are you advocating to adopt a new thing? So we've seen like with the Sunbeam program, um, you're giving governments, I mean, the PHNs, 11 PHNs are investing in the, the, the Sunbeam program um, uh, as 
part of the COVID thing. You've given them something, you can talk that up, you can talk about that. That's a great thing, APA is talking that up. Try to have an action or an ask in your research. What is the research asking for? What is the outcome that you want and how that should be delivered? I'll finish up with two quick things. One is um, you should package this up for MPs. I always look for MPs that have a, an interest in the sector, but they want something for their newsletter. So invite them to something. Invite them to meet you to see your facility. If, let's say, it's in Falls, arrange with the facility to say, come and have a look. We can show you what our program does. They love a photo. They get a package. They, they do this. When packaging up your material, and this is something if you want to contact me through Rick or contact me, I'm more than happy to help you with, it's one page, maybe two at the most. Most ministerial briefs and major things are down to one or two pages. So it's not because they dumb it down. It's because you need to just put your material in a succinct form to say, this is what we've done. This is what it means. This is the value of it. Without it, this will or won't happen. And we need you to do X, Y, and Z in order to do this. Things that we do at APA and other things, I've just done it today, we've provided questions to Senate estimates. Help is up next week. Um, are there issues? Why didn't you look at this research? Why hasn't the department followed up on this? Why didn't the department fund this falls research that showed 25% decrease in, in injury and falls to older people. It was presented to the department six months ago. Why wasn't it funded? Use every opportunity to put into a submission that has anything to do with your research. I call it slice and dice. If you see a submission, there's one on the, the um, disability support pension. There's the, the, the Royal Commission of Aged Care. There's all sorts of, any submission at state or federal level, you, a submission can be one page. I do a lot of one page submissions. Dear inquiry, please see this research. I've attached it. Here's the link. Here it's enclosed. Our research says X, Y, and Z. We urge the committee to look at it. You don't need to go into any more detail about that. But provide those submissions. Provide into Senate estimates. Try to direct relationship with MPs. I cold call them. I did it yesterday. I rang um, a member of parliament we wanted to talk to about veterans affairs funding in the budget, I pick up the phone, I speak to the department, get through to the advisor, can I get your email, here's what I'm sending you. And you build that relationship and I sent them through some stuff on for Senate estimates because there's stuff in the budget that affects physiotherapy and aged, uh, physiotherapy and veterans and we would like it um, brought out into the open because it's not a good budget measure. So I'll stop there because I've talked a lot, Rick. Um, okay. any, sorry to just talk at you, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Look, you gave us so many... I've just filled a page of just notes about, you know, sharpening our message. But does anyone in the audience have anything specific that they want to follow up with Simon? I'll have a look. The, can I ask something, Rick? Yeah. Get away, Bassi. The um, So I was interested in your comment that conflict um, will get the media attention. I suppose my, I, I, I can see that. My question is, Though, does that have a problem with with government when then your message gets blurred? So, you know, the, the thing about the Royal Commission is the um, people have been worried about the HK Royal Commission, the fact that the two commissioners did dis disagree on some aspects. And it is true. The minister did then come out and point that out as a way of getting out of it, to put it bluntly. So... It might be good for the media. My question is, is highlighting that conflict not so go good with government? That's a great question. So one of the things we did in our media response at APA is we highlighted Commissioner Briggs's findings to say we agree with this commissioner um, and noted that the commission didn't come to a unanimous agreement, which is very unusual, but we... Cherry-picked isn't the word, but we did point out the commissioner that we agreed with. Um, you're right, that's a, that age care royal commission is the most difficult one of all because I've never known a royal commission that didn't come up with consensus or unanimous finding. But the conflict in that perhaps will be useful showing that um, could rally the sector behind various aspects of, of the outcomes of that. 
I, I think it's still unknown where we'll go, but it's interesting that the federal government didn't adopt all of the, the Royal Commission findings, certainly not um, in residential aged care, and that the ongoing fallout from that should see, in a good way, aged care kept in the spotlight and up through to the next election over implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission. But you're right to raise it. That sort of conflict with the commission is split is actually very unhelpful because it allows a kind of get out of jail free card for government. And I agree, it, it nullifies my great points that I was trying to make because yeah. it's an unusual example, but we will use that simply to drive the issues of residential aged care, uh, why the government didn't um, agree to support all of the commission inquiry, uh, recommendations. And quickly, sorry, related to that, you talked about falls, you might go into residential care to highlight it, but maybe you'd actually go to a healthy looking active person who fell, got injured, and then suffered a significant quality of life. The truth is when I actually ask, you know, I realize that most of my friends are not in the health field. Actually, they turn off completely whenever there's anything to do with nursing homes. They're not interested in it. And the last by-election, it was they asked about seven things that would influence your vote, and aged care was number seven. Yeah, I know. It's um, um, I know it is it is dispiriting to hear that. But you're right about the res. I use residential aged care settings because. It's, it's the most obvious. But if you look at anything, I don't watch commercial TV except for football, but if you look at um, 730 Report or others, it's always the human interest story. Here's the family affected by the budget. Here's the family that, that does that. They want to interview or see someone that would show. So maybe falls as somebody at home. Maybe it's an example. Last night, 730 covered um, early diagnosis on dementia, followed a family, very important story. So it doesn't have to be... Um, racks, but it, it needs to be something where people can film an interview and have a human interest. It doesn't have to be. It enhances the story. They will always look for the human interest. Who can we interview? Who can we film so that we have something to go with the story? I might just um, hand it over to Professor Cathy Sherrington. I thought I'd just throw your title in there to show that, you know, from uh, establishing your importance. <laughs> you have a question for Simon? Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Simon. That was so helpful. Um, I wanted to pick up on, um, you said something about having done reports, and I wondered if that was a strategy that we could use a bit more. So we obviously do academic publications, but um, perhaps we could be doing more sort of putting out reports that actually sort of summarise the research in a more digestible manner, and then kind of doing an event around that. I mean, do you think that would be a Absolutely. So Mental Health Australia, they don't do it anymore, which is a bit of a shame, but um, summarising. So we used to put together a committee. So like I said, a, a reference group of, of diverse experts, get them to summarise, often outsource, so we might pay, but also have a secretary to put together the findings or to package it up with. So we also made sure all our publications were styled in the same way so that there was a look and feel, no more than 30 to 40 pages not full of glossy photos of happy people, but with, with good infographics. And we used it to summarise because most people don't read more than an executive summary. So in a sense, it was an executive summary of his cannabis and mental health. Um, here was one on services. So when Mental Health Australia, Mental Health Council put out Not For Service, the landmark document in 2004 or five, it was a thousand pages. And what they did was then put out a summary report that went with it that was about 30 pages. Nobody read the thousand, thousand pages of failure of service in mental health, but we made a summary report. And that's the document we took with us everywhere to meetings with politicians, to departments. Here's the summary. So Kathy, that's absolutely, I think, um, a brilliant way of approaching it. Make a easily, when I say digestible, a summary report and launch the summary document. Simon, I'm going to say thank you because I'd like to um, take the opportunity just to say on behalf of everybody, thank you for giving up um, some of your leave time for presenting today and offering to stay around to listen to Professor Andrew Wilson's talk and, and perhaps there may be questions for the both of you. But um, for the moment, thank you and we'll talk to you. In Can I just say, Rick, to anyone, if anybody wants to contact me or wants anything, I'd be more than happy to help you if I can. Can't do a launch or anything, but if there are anything further, feel free to contact me at APA or through Rick. And John Stace, did you want to say something? 
You're on mute at the moment. Oh, we can't hear you, John. John, you want to type your question in just because we couldn't hear it? I think he was saying that's the best presentation he's ever heard. But type your question in and at the end of the session, if it still sounds not great, <laughs> I'll just read it out for Simon. I'm sure Andrew can um, contribute. Thanks, Kathy, John. do you want to say anything? Oh, just, you're clapping. I didn't know. I thought that was a question, so thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce Professor Andrew Wilson, who's the director of the Menzies Centre for Health Policy, uh, uh, at, uh, which is also attached to the School of Public Health. Um, he's also the co-director of the NHMRC Partnership Centre on Systems Perspectives on Prevention of Lifestyle-Related Chronic Disease. And his research and teaching has included all aspects of health policy, especially chronic disease. Uh, and in addition to his current academic career, he's been the Deputy uh, Director General of Policy, Planning and Resourcing in Queensland Health and the Chief Health Officer, Deputy Director General, Public Health in New South Wales Health. So we feel very privileged to have you here, Andrew. And um, uh, I'll hand it to you. If you need to share your screen, share your screen, or if it's a bit more, uh, more of a, a lecture style, we'll leave it to you. Well, thank you very much uh, for this. And I apologize, I'm having to, um, I'm talking to you from one of those cocoon chairs uh, at the, cause I've just come out of a board meeting. So apologies if this, um, if I sound a bit odd. Um, uh, I'm going to try and share my screen. If not, I will just, I will talk to the, to, to the topic, but let me see if I can share my screen. And, uh, and then if so, I'll talk to that. And if not, well, we'll just, uh, We'll deal with um, we'll deal with that if I can't. Are you seeing my screen now? Yeah, we can see it. It's, it's small. Is there any way of increasing yep, the size? Let's just, uh, let's just try that one. Uh, where are we? Uh, sorry, I'm having a bit of difficulty. Getting it to explode. Maybe press slide in this show. format. Sorry. Slideshow in the top, just under view options. I tried this this morning. That's how I know. What What are you actually seeing at the moment? We're seeing your slides, but it only takes up about a quarter of our screen. So, that's it. Um, Is that any better? That's better. We might be okay. happy with that. <laughs> Let, let's see how we go, uh, and um, uh, I will talk to it anyway. So, look, I, I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of, of health policy, as that's the thing that I know the most about. But a lot of what I'm going to say is really um, irrelevant to making um, research um, uh, in translating research uh, and making it impactful more generally in relation to that. Um, you know, I, I've Comment, I frequently start with this particular slide, um, not just because I love it as a slide, um, but because um, when we're talking about sort of policy, there's, there's a lot of different, you know, it, it, people sort of think about this as sort of some sort of defined uh, entity. But in fact, there's a lot of things that we call policy, um, everything from uh, processes that are set in place within clinical environments to guide the way people work. Um, through to the thing that we more generally think of policy as in sort of decisions of government uh, that guide different areas and, and whatever of practice. So it's important and we're thinking about our research and thinking about what we're trying to influence to also think about the nature of the, of the beast. What, what is the thing that, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit as I move through it. One of the other things is that when we think about the composition of, of uh, uh, research informing policy, but this is also true 
of uh, research informing um, uh, practice. The, it, we, we think about it as a sort of linear process that we have some existing practice and we want to move to sort of some new practice or some from old pol policy to new policy. And that there are a range of things that influence that, like ideological ins inspiration, um, the opportunities for change. And, and, and part of that is, is, and clearly important from our perspective as researchers, is, is the role of evidence in research and informing that. Um, we also need to sort of be mindful that things like experience and common sense are things which are frequently co quoted within the decision-making process. But because of our sort of rational view of the world, we tend to sort of think about this as a relatively linear process. The reality, of course, is quite different. The reality is something which is much more complex, where there are a whole range of factors which are influential, influential um, and which uh, have, uh, uh, and where you will frequently have within the same policy decision, different types of evidence being used in different types of ways, and sometimes quite contrary to the way uh, that we originally anticipated um, that that evidence would be provided. And, and in fact, we also need to be mindful that when we think about policy and the way policy and what is, is influence in particular, that, that the, the evidentiary basis of it, the thing that we spend most of our time um, uh, uh, on developing is probably a relatively small part of it, particularly if we're talking about um, big P type policies, that is government type policies. And, and, and we sort of tend to forget that there's that, that big wheel there, the politics and that understanding that politics is, is as much a, as important and the research that goes into understanding that politics is as important as the research that goes into establishing an evidentiary basis for what we're, you know, what we're talking about. Um, and we, we have to start with a very real world perspective. And I think some of what you are discussing just kept coming in on the tail end of it. Was very, was very much about this sort of real world context of what's happening. You know, there are lots and lots of examples at the moment where there is good evidence for what we should do, um, which is being uh, ignored uh, in, the, in the real world of politics. Something that we don't sort of think about um, in, in this context is uh, the, the, the fact that, that when uh, we're talking about the importance of fact of, of uh, particular types of things that we're trying to influence is that it's very rare uh, that we're in a, in a situation where there aren't competing uh, interests in that regard. And that last comment, the last uh, this, uh, the, the, there about, you know, the importance of uh, aged care and where that sits in, uh, in people's um, radar is a very good example. If you think about the current environment where we've just had a Royal Commission uh, of Inquiry uh, quite, you know, with um, uh, really quite uh, devastating um, uh, stories being told, um, uh, analyses being presented of what's it, what, what was actually happening and, a, a, you know, a very a deep uh, and th well thought through response to what should happen in relation to that. You, you know, you would sort of think that it would be the, uh, the, the, the talk of the day, but here we are, we've got COVID circulating around, we've got another inquiry into, uh, into disability, uh, we've got a whole range of other issues that people are being asked to consider uh, at, at the same time. So that's true of Joe Public, but it's also, or Joanne Public, but it's also uh, true of, uh, of uh, decision makers generally in government and uh, in politics, that they've got a whole range of other things on our radar. And we've got to try and surface our things uh, at, at the things that we're important uh, so that they hear us and they give us an appropriate intention in that. Um, I talk about my, my principles, the Wilson principles, um, and they're, they're really ex they're principles that, uh, that have come from my experience of working in this environment. And uh, th these are just a, a, a five of, I think, of the critical ones that relate to this. The first is that whatever context we're working in, um, in there will be decisions will be made. Um, and the challenge for us is how do we best inform those decisions? What do we need to do? What do we need to, to, uh, to understand to be able to inform those decisions? 
part of that is that some voices are heard more than others. There's, so there's a question about who's carrying our message? How, how are we getting that across? And again, you know, the very nice uh, comment there at the end about you know, the importance, for example, of having the right sort of documentation, things that can be digested, that can be uh, readily achievable by people, is uh, re readily, uh, uh, um, readily accessible by people uh, is really important. Um, we also sometimes get frustrated because people say, uh, oh, well, we'll get, we need some more research around that. Well, it, it, that is a legitimate uh, policy option. We shouldn't dismiss it because sometimes the things we're talking about are not as clear cut as we might like uh, to make out. And we need to understand and we need to be able to make sure that where, where that does come up, um, that we've either got a response to it um, or... Uh, we're able to inform where that decision is most likely to be informative. Uh, I sort of already made this point, but evidence and information are critical, but they're not sufficient. There are all those other things that we need to in, uh, that we need to take on board. And lastly, that timing timing is the essence of uh, of influence. That we've got to think about where those opportunities arise and making sure we're ready with our. Uh, with our case, with our evidence uh, to be made at that point when, it, when, that, when that opportunity arises. We can, we can make our research more policy informative. We can do that by understanding the policy context, what and who is, being, is open to be informed. Uh, concepts such as co-design and co-production um, uh, uh, ideals uh, that, we, that we aspire to uh, and which certainly do seem to uh, lead to research being more informative. But uh, I can tell you from our experience in the Partnership Centre, where our main partners are actually uh, uh, primarily government bodies, that even when they're partnering with you, co-design and co-production is a really difficult thing when you're doing it with government. So consultation may be as, 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 as good as you're going to get in relation to that. The issue of timeliness, what's the decision window, that, that sort of being ready, that, that uh, time is the essence. How much evidence is enough? What type of evidence is going to be influential? And what are the opportunities to influence? These are all things that we can think about in terms of our re research to make it more policy and practice for that matter informative. You have to be mindful of the context in which it's occurring. You know, I frequently hear people saying, you know, well, uh, th this country do, th you know, does it so much. Uh, for example, I'm the chair of the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. And, uh, you know, we're frequently challenged with people saying, oh, you know, there are systems, much better systems elsewhere for approving uh, uh, the, the drugs uh, for listing on the PBS. And, and my response to that is not to say, that, you know, not to rubbish it, not to sort of go madly defensive of what we've got at the moment. Of course, we can learn and improve. But these sort of systems evolve within a, you know, our health system evolves within a, within a culture, within a socioeconomic environment, within a, with a history. And you need to understand these things if you want to influence what's going to happen. You know, in Australia, we have six states, two territories, one Commonwealth, plus numerous local governments. You know, we have public and uh, we have a funding mechanism, which is uh, multi-stranded with funding coming from public purse, insurance, uh, and a large slice of personal funding. We have a whole range of different uh, uh, providers. We've got multiple vested interests, even outside of the sort of professional groups that might be interested. And we've got communities who have a whole range of issues, uh, which are not just those which relate to health. So there's, there's a couple of ways of thinking about this, and I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to really put these up here to sort of uh, to stimulate you to go out and, and have, a, have a look and think about some of these. There's a thing called the, the rocket model, which was developed by Lucy Retnick, uh, Adrian Bowman and others um, back in 2012, which, which is one way of thinking about, uh, the, about this sort of being impactful in terms of our research about the need to problem definition of looking at different types of solution or solution generation of intervention testing intervention replication and dissemination of research as a, as a way of going from, a, uh, a, you know, from a, an interesting question uh, through to something which is actually impactful uh, in terms of what's actually going to happen. The, a more detailed uh, way of looking at this uh, is this, uh, and this paper from uh, Gantry and others, 
about translating research into policy uh, and why it's so hard. It's a, it's a, it's an easy read. Uh, not on my screen at the or your screens at the moment. I'm sure. Uh, even in my zoomed in um, uh, slide here, I'm sure it's probably pretty uh, difficult to read. Um, but you know, there are ways of thinking different sorts of models uh, that are worthwhile thinking about because there is no one right model. Uh, it's a matter of looking at the different ways of doing this and thinking which might be more more appropriate for the setting and for the and for the topic that you're trying to influence. And at the end of the day, it may end up being a, 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 um, a mixture of these, a hybrid of these that's probably more common than not. But I think this was a, a useful paper. I'll just go back there. A useful paper uh, for me anyway in thinking about the, uh, the models of translation or utilisation of research in practice and policy, particularly in the public health sphere. Um, and then lastly, uh, there's a, a lovely piece of work which was actually done by a uh, uh, um, Sally Harvers, a PhD student that I supervised. And Sally was uh, looking at the question, she's uh, an infection uh, control nurse by background, and she was looking at the issue of how uh, policy gets translated um, from uh, you know, the high level policy perspective down to what actually happens to patient care. And uh, she uh, developed the sort of model of, uh, imp of implementation of policy from policy to patient care, uh, which, has been, um, which has been published. And it's, it's informative uh, it, from a research point of view, because when you uh, look at the model and think about the different elements to it, um, it, it guides the sorts of things that one might want to build into your research uh, to, uh, to be more informative from that perspective. So uh, look, that's a, a, a fairly rapid trot uh, through a whole range of areas to just to give you an over, uh, give you a, a, hopefully give you a little bit of insight into the way that, that I think about this question of being impactful for on research and practice. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. And of course, uh, you're more than welcome to my, my presentation. Thanks so much, Andrew. It was uh, a really, um, it's going to be a really useful presentation for all of us to come back to and explore. So thank you for the offer of sharing that, those articles and the information. Um, does anyone have any specific questions that they would like to ask Andrew? Feel free just to pop your hand up or jump online. I've got a question, you know, a lot of the information you're talking about timing and context and in regards to the Aged Care Royal Commission, it seemed like a really great time for organisations such as this CRE about falls and, you know, vested instrument uh, groups like AAG and the Australian Physio Association. Um, but I feel like there were so many other things that popped up literally the week that they released the Royal Commission report and it's just sort of been brushed under and then the government's budget response was a big chunk of money that the, the Joe, be it Jody or Joseph, thinks is really good, but we know there's a lot of structural problems about how to shape aged care to create really good sustainable health outcomes. What do organisations like the CRE going down the track, how do we pivot the focus back to this sort of research or evidence-based reform that's going to be sustainable? How do we Yeah, look, uh, and that's a really, that, that last sort of uh, um, statement is really important. Um, it, you know, it, it's rare that we're able to change these things overnight. And, you know, it used to frustrate me um, that uh, in a way we kept on having, kept on, redoing research, uh, you know, um, and uh, it sort of frustrated me. Well, why do we have to keep on asking this question and, and, and thinking about new sexy ways of, uh, of answering the same question? And the answer is, it, it sort of has evolved for me. Um, uh, the answer that's evolved for me is that actually that is, the, you have to keep on doing that. If you want to be, if you want to influence things, you have to have new ways of being able to present the same thing. 
And so to some extent, until you actually get that change, we are trapped in a situation of having to refresh our evidence base, um, even though we might actually be addressing some, you know, a, very, uh, a very similar question. Of course, we can always, you know, we can do more. Uh, we, of course, we can, um, you know, we can improve the, the quality of the evidence. And of course, we'll have new interventions to test uh, that will hopefully be more effective um, in that regard. But there's also just this element that uh, we have to keep on refreshing the evidence to keep it, to keep the debate and to uh, and to alive and to be able to present that in a in a fresh way. And I think for the CRE, that's a really important um, uh, consideration um, uh, because the CRE at least has a five year. A longevity. A lot of us, a lot of research doesn't even have that. Just a quick comment. I was listening to seven thirty on Monday night, and it, they were talking about the, the amount of deaths that we've had with COVID last year versus flu. But you know, Lee Sales mentioned a comment. We you know we ought to put that in the context that we have the largest um, cause of elderly death is falls. Where's the community debate around that? And that was the first time I've heard anyone say so. You know. It's interesting, CREs in its beginning stages, um, the, at the moment, COVID's going to be that such hot topic. I think your advice is really good that we have to be patient, get our message right, you know, learn. You know, I say this is a HDR student, so I should um, not say too much, but, yeah, I just thought I'd follow that up with a statement. But we have a question from Andrew Malat. Do you have any advice on capturing the policy narrative and we understand that media is only a part of this. What other elements can we focus on to capture this policy narrative? Well, I mean, I, I, I would love to just seize the opportunity and reflect that question back to Andrew, uh, given that he lives in that uh, in that environment um, and, and knows uh, how well, how difficult it is to uh, to be able to to seize the narrative. Uh, look, I mean, um, I, I think. Um, there are a number of things that I think are important um, in trying to uh, to do this. One is first uh, is is to be clear on what your narrative is. I think you know that comes back to my uh, to my Homer uh, cartoon back there that of you know politicians and public being bombarded uh, with different types of things. Um, the more you have a clear message and one that you repeat over and over again, uh, the more uh, you're likely to, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to start to sink in in relation to it. And the more that you can illustrate that uh, with uh, examples uh, of what's going on. Again, coming back to your question in relation to the role of the CRE, I mean, you, you, you know, we're never going to be able to trans uh, to um, transform uh, the, uh, the the age the residential aged care sector overnight, but we can uh, influence little bits of it so that there are examples of what you can do. And I think at the moment, one of the things that you know in the aged care area that I'd really like to see more of is where are the sort of examples that you can take people and show, well, this is what can be achieved. Um, and, and similarly, you know, if you think about the falls area and if you took any particular environment, what are our, what are our examples that we can, you know, we can take a politician and walk them through and say, look, this is what can be achieved. It's not impossible. These are not impossible dreams. Uh, these are, you know, the, the, this, this is what can be aspired to. And, and I think, again, part of that uh, gathering the narrative is having those, those examples that we can take people to to see, you know, what's possible. Because a lot of the time, you know, people will read our research, particularly our interventional research, and they say, oh, look, yeah, of course you can do that in the highly controlled environment, research environment, but it's not what happens in the real world. And uh, the more that we can actually have those living examples uh, of uh, where the research has been and, trans and translated and worked, uh, the more it becomes a narrative which is uh, which is um, uh, you know, which is sellable. But I, I it would be I'd be interested to hear what Andrew's view in relation to this. Andrew, do you have a response? Yeah, I th thanks, thanks, Andrew. Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's multiple strategies that you need to put in place, and having a very clear, well thought out 
narrative to begin with and communicating that to various stakeholders and repeating it in related but slightly different ways, I think uh, throughout a system is what I've observed is, is one of the effective strategies. It is challenging because I think um, the first presenter did a fantastic job about talking about the media element of that and media is part of that. And obviously advocacy groups uh, get attention to their issues. Um, but I think what's interesting is that you're operating not just with political leaders, but there's a bureaucracy. There are other stakeholders that are competing in that place for time, energy and bandwidth of you know, those political leaders. Uh, but also policymakers. So I think it's having a clear narrative, certainly upon your reflections are fantastic, Andrew, on that. The other is just having those really, you know, killer facts, but also practical examples. And I've, I've sat in, a, in rooms in the past where we have had uh, an opportunity to fund new investment portfolios. And we've had researchers come and present some really fantastic, promising research that has been shown to be highly effective. And um, myself and colleagues have asked questions like, uh, that's fantastic. So uh, with that particular piece of research, uh, you've, you've achieved this level of efficacy. Um, how many people do you think it would take based on the workforce you used in that study to implement this across a state? And if so, what would that workforce be? Would it be a physiotherapist? Would it be a health worker? Would it be a nurse? Um, what would that likely cost? So thinking about some of those broader infrastructure things about what an end state might look like for your intervention is a useful thing to have a conversation, particularly in those rare opportunities or policy windows that Andrew uh, talked about in his presentation are there. If you've got that information, it's by no means a certain thing, but it certainly makes a, the right decision uh, an easier one when you've got that information there available. So I think you know, the importance of taking that sort of system view is, is, is important. Thanks, Andrew. Kathy, you've got a question or a oh, comment? Go to Matt's first. All right, we've got a question about from Matt Jennings, who um, leads the Allied Health in one of our PHNs in Sydney, talking about how do we keep our teams on track with key messages? Um, and and we know that sometimes we can be active siloed, and we need to. We don't want to be divided and conquered. Did that a great sum up of your question, Matt? Yeah, the key thing that I see is you can have lots of people with a key message, but even in a group like this, is everyone in this team sending that same message or the same priorities? And I don't think we do. And then the second part of it is, um, I suppose, how we tailor those different messages to the different groups. I think Andrew answered that bit. I think that was really important. It was a different message. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Look, I, I, I think uh, there is a, a absolutely critical. There's, you know... From a research point of view, having diversity of opinion is and, and diversity of and, and get and challenging challenging each other's research and and doing all those things is absolutely critical to good research. Um, it's entirely the opposite when you're trying to sell your story, particularly if you're trying to sell your story to uh, to politicians. Um, you know, I've been in the room with uh, where where you know a group of re researchers have come in with the best will in the world. Um, you know, to try and convince a minister to do something and then sort of entered into one of their regular arguments about, um, you know, who had the best, uh, you know, uh, 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 had the best way of studying it and had a slightly different views about what it is and just lost the plot because they just didn't stick to uh, what was the key message that they were getting across. So, you know, among a research teams, if you want to go into this space, you have to agree in advance what are the core elements that you might want to have, you know, that you're trying to get across and put the other differences aside uh, for, uh, you know, to be dis discussed at some, some other point. Uh, you've got to stay focused um, uh, around that. Um, we, you know, we've spent a bit of time in the, uh, in the prevention centre where working out strategies around this about how we formulate um, uh, things so, you know, um, Andrew was talking about the sort of the killer facts, uh, the, um, the, uh, the 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 um, key things that you want to say, and and different ways that you can express those things in a way which makes them more um, uh, more accessible uh, for, for people who are not necessarily familiar off the area. 
of the area. The other thing that we've we've spent a bit of time on is looking at also how you respond to the, the negatives, the things where people, uh, you know, will, will trot out the old, uh, an old uh, or long-standing argument against it. So, you know, the common one that we deal with in the prevention space is the nature of the, is the idea of the nanny state of people, you know, that it, this is the, the state telling people what to do. So we've got a whole series of sort of, um, of responses that we've worked out about how you respond to, you know, to, to the notion of the nanny state if it's, uh, if it's raised within that sort of context. So thinking about that side of it is also important. Um, Kathy, do you want to follow up with your question? I know we're running out of time, but... Yeah, just quickly. Um, thank you so much. Actually, both Andrews, that was um, yeah, really, really helpful. My question was just, um, you know, what else can we be doing as researchers to get ready in case there are opportunities? And so another thing we were thinking about is kind of collecting like patient stories and kind of testimonials and kind of little videos about how people's lives, you know, literally are changed with um, falls prevention interventions. Do, do you think that would be useful? Look, I think the... Uh... The power of a uh, of a of a story of a personal story, particularly with politicians, is not to be is is um, can't be under undervalued. Um, I, I can think of two examples, perhaps one more for more uh, evident to this area. Uh, when I was working in Queensland, uh, in Queensland Health, um, we were trying to get up a program around. Um, uh, deep brain stimulation for uh, Parkinson's disease, and um, it, you know, we, we there was always competition for, uh, you know, what spare dollars there are in the system, and you've got to get a way to get it. And at the end of the day, um, you need to, you know, when it comes to sort of that final decision about what's going to get up and what's not going to get up, um, you, you you need you 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 frequently need to have a sort of ministerial voice in that. And uh, it just so happens that there was a man uh, from the health minister's electorate who uh, had um, been an active cyclist who developed Parkinson, got quite severe Parkinsonism and couldn't ride anymore, got deep brain stimulation, got back on his and was able to ride again. Didn't obviously cure his Parkinsonism, but gave him enough back. And we got that story and like, it was, what could the minister say? I mean, it was just such a powerful story, uh, a powerful illustration of, of what, you know, of what we wanted. Um, you know, another example in New South Wales, um, when we were trying to get up legislation um, about uh, banning smoking in pubs and clubs, um, and uh, this had been going on for many, many years. Uh, all the evidence was there to support it, etc. And we just couldn't get the across the line politically. And then one day, uh, the minister walked in and just out of the blue said, "Look, uh, I want to go ahead with the legislation." Anyway, a few years later, uh, I happened to be having a drink with him, and I asked him, you know, what it was that changed his mind at that point in time, expecting to say, oh, he, you know, it, it would have been sort of uh, uh, lobbying from this or that. And he said, well, he said, last night, uh, that the night before, I'd been out to dinner with my family. We were in a restaurant, and my daughter started coughing because she has asthma when somebody started to smoke nearby, you know, um, uh, these things are highly influential in, in those final decisions. Just a comment. I was reflecting about one of the standout performers of the Royal Commission last year and it was the lady Mel Mitchell that's done so much media who was talking about her experience living in residential and how frightened she was. And she's done so much media talking about and her experience within aged care. So I think it reflects that personal stories do grab the attention and help steer the narrative so on that note it is 2 36 i feel like everybody's probably got meetings and work that needs to be done so i just want to thank um andrew and simon for speaking today it's been so useful and um so much for all of us to unpack and think about and plan and strategize i'd love to think go back and look at the cre and look about the overarching ask or 
message or yeah so and a big thanks to sandra for organizing today um and thank you for everybody to come so we'll see you all around the cre zoom halls in over the years <laughs>